Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll be discussing learning opportunities provided by children and science museums and how children learn with special guest, Deborah, Deborah Spiegelman, uh, CEO at the Miami Children's Museum, Carolyn Payson, Executive Director of the Providence Children's Museum, and Matt Sinclair, President and CEO at the Terry Lee Wells Nevada Discovery Museum. So thank you for joining us. When you look at hands-on learning for children, it's particularly important, and there's an interactive social component uh, of, of children's museums that is just totally different than anything that, that a child would experience within a classroom. There is collaborative learning, it's free form, it's self-navigated. And then of course you get to play with your kids and play with your grandkids, have, have them play, but also go through steps of learning real concrete skills. So let's start the conversation by taking stock of the advantages of different forms of learning and compare the structured classroom environment to your environment over at the Miami Children's Museum. Deborah? Well, I think the Miami Children's Museum is unique because we get to see children in a classroom. We are the only children's museum today that has a full charter school. So we have children in formal education from a year old in our preschool up to fifth grade. So we get this exciting comparison on a daily basis because we have 400 children in classrooms. And then we have those same children learning um, in our informal environment through play. And I think it's very important to talk about the value of play in learning and how children learn by having fun. We have evidence that shows that the curriculum that's taught in the classroom can be brought into our museum gallery where children are excited through the hands-on learning. So I don't think it's taking a choice of one or the other, but the careful integration of formal learning and formal learning through play that's very important. Now, the workflow is so intimate, right? At your organization, you, you have a classroom experience in which a teacher is is conveying certain knowledge. And then you have a play experience going back and forth. So you're seeing this comparison. When you look at your teachers and how their attitudes, and they come from different places, they come from largely places where they don't have that kind of juxtaposition. How do they see the advantages of, of being in a charter school that is attached to a, to a children's museum? How do they see the advantages compared to their previous experiences? Well, the teachers, I think, relate very well to the hands-on experience because the children, every child learns and the true gift in a teacher is being able to unlock what that child's gift is and how their learning style is best developed. So some children learn through reading, some children learn through um, verbal communication and the play in the gallery. Um, the hands-on component reinforces the more formal learning, whether it's verbal or um, reading. Literacy takes so many forms, and it's something that we have to be aware of and just do the best we can with each child. And I think that what Children's Museum showed parents through the pandemic is to create a fun environment at home. One of the things that we were able to do is create learning packets and help families create that fun environment. Because a child sitting in front of a screen for six or seven hours a day, I think we can all agree, just didn't work. It's not, it's not quite the experience that you want. And Matt, your, your museum is dedicated to teaching science. We're in a, um, in a real interesting civil society discussion about science, right? I mean, math textbooks are now controversial. We were talking beforehand about uh, jokingly about, you know, when I get my my bill at the end, uh, you know, after after eating at a restaurant, I can definitely tell whether that math is a Democratic or, or a Republican math, uh, you know, problem. Um, it's 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 crazy, isn't it? How do you deal with this sort of science teaching in a time of pandemic questioning on the validity of, of fundamental science? Yeah, great, great question. And, you know, uh, for, for many of us in the science museum field, we've enjoyed the fact that by and large, uh, 
prior to the pandemic, our, our work was largely viewed as bipartisan and, and more or less uh, non-controversial. Neutral, uh, right? Pretty neutral. Uh, so it caught a lot of us, I think, a little flat footed to suddenly be on the front lines on this, you know, national and international war on science. Uh, the, the mental shift that, that we made here at the discovery amongst the staff uh, as we began to see that was to embrace the fact that what we were seeing real time in front of us was the degree of scientific literacy uh, in our nation. And of course, those of us doing this work as science educators, both formal and informal, have known this for a long time. This is one of the many things that we've let decline uh, in our in our formal side of education. And so we've been making this case for quite some time, but the last two years has, uh, I think, uh, given us a, a real bright spotlight on the need for scientific literacy and engagement. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, a, a terrible little virus has given us, you know, a great teaching platform in our in our spaces uh, to engage with our visitors on on facts and what is the scientific method and what is this you know incredible breakthrough technology uh, that helped us get to a, a, an RNA vaccine what is an RNA vaccine and just introducing this whole new world of of science to folks that is and real viral Paxlovid and those kinds of things I I had COVID recently and Paxlovid I tell you I was I was headed into a very bad place and Paxlovid. Uh, really, really turned that around. And, and exactly. Matt, you're also talking about this whole idea of, of another form of learning, social learning, which you, you can do through play. Caroline, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how we can actually be informed by our kids and how they, they play together and work together and communicate together before they have a sensibility necessarily on political divisions and cultural wars and all that nonsense, right? Mm-hmm. How, do we, how do we end up with a situation where children who become adult, who become youth, who become adults, end up being able to actually talk with each other, isn't it through that that idea of just sort of different people coming together and and playing and just sort of getting along and figuring it out? No, it's and certainly I think that's one of the core things that you know. Obviously, we talk about play being an introduction to learning, and some of that learning is the more formal learning in school. But also, the idea of play is sort of that window into social and emotional growth and supporting children's mental health. <clears throat> We've really noticed it, you know, post COVID, where we're welcoming people back, and we're seeing what has been, you know, kids who have been for the most part, we, you know, especially during weekday mornings when we've got very young kids, we might have three or four year olds who have not been into a museum before, who have not been in with other little kids. And for some of them, they're terrified, right? They don't know how to interact anymore, but they tend to warm up. But then you've got kids who go from person to person saying, will you play with me? And you know, so it. I think it is really important that we need to do that as adults, don't we? We have to go a to a person bit. we You're don't know right. and say, "Will you play with me? Will you? Will you have a discussion? Right. Can we actually be different?" And that's okay. Isn't that cool? It's a hundred percent cool. And how do we give kids that opportunity in a children's museum where they can play and interact? But they, you know, obviously they can't take the choice and go home. So they have to share if they both want to be at the same place. They have to have a conversation. It's really cool that if you start to build something and someone builds on it, everybody gets something better. Right. And it gives them that opportunity. And we're so excited that, you know, post pandemic, we've been able to, you know, start that again and have kids interact. And I think it's also important to see how families as an entire unit are interacting because so many people were so isolated in their own little bubble for so long. And we've noticed that families are interacting and building upon and parents had to learn to to socialize again. And, you know, think of how long we were in our little bubble. And then, then when you take uh, we take that and then you take objective lessons, for example, if you're sitting there with somebody and you're deciding that 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 looks really interesting, it's it's it, it's a it's a little exhibit about um, how you can make a paper airplane and, and, and how far it can fly. And then you're you're working with your partner and you're sort of figuring it out and 
and and you know they disagree with you and they and they think that it should be something else and then you decide to make two different air paper airplanes and test them out against each other you're dealing with the scientific method you're dealing with collaboration you're dealing with social skills all of a sudden you you start to think wow congress should should come to a children's museum shouldn't they absolutely we could do team building we could, well, you know, it, it, it's it, it's it's a real thought. We just completed a a uh, poll. As a matter of fact, it's it, it's still in progress, but I think it's it, it's close to being completed. And, and we said, what kind of learning do children's museums do the best job at advancing? And it's interesting. Um, the the uh, the majority said tactile, touch, right? Um, visual um, also received some social emotional learning. Um, but those were really the the, the three that, that got it. Matt, is it is that about what how you see it? Is is that tactile uh, piece really the, the the key the key part of this? Because we can't do that on the internet, right? I mean, you can touch a screen, but it's still flat, no matter what you see. Yeah. So so in the the science center model that we practice here. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a visual aid for you, but if you if you kind of create yourself a funnel or an inverted pyramid, you know, think of the experience in three different layers. You know, we have we have exhibits and other activities that we do that are attractors. Those are those are things that draw people in. Maybe you push a button on an exhibit, or you read a text panel, or you do a thing. You know, our our touch points are the broadest at that point, but the depth of learning is probably the most shallow. And then we kind of go into that second tier of engagement. And that's where we draw visitors into maybe a, a laboratory space or a workshop where they're going to spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes in, in something rather than 15 seconds. And then kind of at the, the tip of that funnel is this idea of, of mastery. Uh, so maybe they're going to participate in an hour long workshop or sit through a, a stage show or demonstration that we have or tend, tend to camp. You know, the idea is that through these mechanisms, we're just continuing to deepen the engagement and, and, and elevate the level of, of knowledge and, and information that our visitors are getting. But it is this balanced portfolio. You know, as museum educators, we want every visitor to come in and get to that mastery point and walk out our door, the next Nobel laureate. But, you know, if all they do is come in and and become curious and we create those aha moments, that's a home run for us. And so having that mix of of engagement models in different ways for visitors to sort of self-direct either by themselves or with their families or whatever group unit they come through, we, we can meet a visitor wherever they're at and, and pull them along in that learning journey. And I think that that's really essential to spaces like ours. So uh, could, could you talk a little bit about, about your engagement model? Because you have this sort of combination, which is very complimentary. Go, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, I think in a children's museum, when a child comes in, children learn through repeat. Um, experiences. And a child comes in on Monday and will try something one way and on Tuesday come back. And it's a completely different experience because they're seeing it differently and children learn again through the repetition and the process of doing something time and time again. Children don't get bored in children's museums. And there's a conversation in our field, and I see Carol uh, smiling about this, but how often do we need to change the exhibits? Are we changing the exhibits for the children or are we changing them for the caregiver? Yeah. And oftentimes we find that the caregiver is the one who's driving and making the decision right. in essence. So we have to keep our exhibits fresh and exciting, but children learn and they find the discovery fantastic. So, I'm oh, sorry. I, I agree with you. And one of the things I would also add is that, you know, we are very child driven, right? The kid can go back. How many times do we have parents say, I went to the children's museum and my child would only play with one thing. It's a waste of money. And you have to say, no, it's not like you're, it's your one chance at the Met and you have to go through every single thing or you've, you know, you've lost it. Really, it's about, they will change every time they go to it, right? They will learn and move on and have a different interaction with every piece in there. So you have to let them have it. Um, but also just to piggyback a little bit on what Matt said, 
Um, when we talk about um, sort of providing mastery or even aha moments, I think one of the things that children's museums needs to own as well is that we are very often that first cultural institution for children. And we know they are going to grow out of us. So really part of our job is to get them used to a cultural institution and be confident in its interactions and understand that it's a place for them, no matter what their background is, so that when they go other places, regardless of whether they got free admission because they have an, you know, a food assistance card or their parents are regular museum goers, they bring that ownership because they started with a place that was driven by them. And that's and what that's, kudos to you, by the way, uh, Caroline, for having a bilingual website. I mean, one of the one of the things that I'm really concerned about is that we have, first of all, we have uh, children in Discovery Museum um, deserts in this country, areas of the country where there, there there's no such institution. And then the other piece is that um, you have kids whose because of the of the um, awkwardness in our society. Um, in terms of uh, uh, people of different backgrounds connecting with each other, people of different languages connecting with each other. Um, we have um, issues of, of people, who, for example, who are wearing headscarves and burqas and so on and so forth, not feeling like they can enter into public spaces like a children's museum or somebody who, whose family might just speak Spanish or a different language. Um, not being able to enter in. How do we deal with that aspect to ensure that children, children in America should basically have access to these very valuable experiences? Uh, Caroline, um, you're, you're investing in, in, in this website, in the Spanish language piece, and it must be difficult to keep everything up to date in two languages. It is. We decided it was important to us. Providence, although we're in New England City, we're a majority minority city. Providence itself, although the rest of the state might be a little bit different. All of our signage is in Spanish and English as well. We want people to feel comfortable and again, feel that ownership. Um, we, you know, I'm going to turn off my camera for one second and just very quickly show you if um, our new logo. Um, where we very much wanted for, for children, we didn't want blue kids or green kids or squiggly line kids or star kids. It was very important for us that every child see themselves reflected in our logo. That's so um, we worked with the team to do that. So I know representation isn't everything um, or the only thing, but it's a great starting point. So we try to look at it th throughout. We pay our Spanish speaking floor staff an extra dollar an hour to demonstrate that as a skill that we're supporting and paying for. So we're just trying from soup to nuts to make sure that we're valuing it. We're putting it up front and um, we want everyone to see themselves here and see themselves included. And Matt, when we were doing the search that resulted in, in, in your hiring uh, over at the Terry B. Wells uh, Nevada Discovery Museum, we talked with the school superintendent who okay. talked specifically and that's the sixth largest school district in the nation, right? It talks specifically about the importance of this institution and, and these institutions in general to creating a level playing field for kids so that kids actually have all of the opportunity that America promises our children, right? Correct. And it, it, I want to kind of build on, on what Caroline was saying. Um, while we're not at a place where we've got a bilingual website yet, uh, you know, we're we're probably about uh, approaching just north of 50 percent of our exhibits are now bilingual. And and we were on an exhibit master plan to move. So that's 100 percent. But but more importantly than that, when we're doing content development, all of that is originating in Spanish and then being translated to English instead of what is typically done. We create all this stuff. We create it in English and we hand it over to somebody and say, can you translate this for us? Because there are losses in translation. So everything is organically developed in Spanish and then ported over. But the thing I'm most excited about is that when, uh, when our visitors are coming in, and as a science center, make no mistake, about 80% of our visitors are going to be families with kids under the age of 12. A lot of my audience overlaps with Deborah's and Caroline's in terms of the demographic. And we work with our local university. I've got, you know, 35 part-time employees and uh, that serve as visitor services reps, as our museum education staff. And uh, the University of Nevada is two miles up the road from me. 
uh, uh, not not all, it's not a requirement, but the majority of our part-time staff, we've hired through uh, the university in a program called TRIO, which is a, a program designed to support first-generation minority college students. Uh, and so these guys, uh, any student from that program um, is guaranteed an interview for any job that we have open. And as a result, uh, about 70% of our part-time staff comes out of that program. Uh, they are bilingual themselves. They are uh, young adults that look really close to the young adults coming through our door. So, and you're training the next generation of museum leaders, right? Correct. And, and we're thinking about, you know, uh, breaking down the barriers and, and addressing the issues that come up when segments of our society see institutions like ours and think, well, that's not a place for me. Um, and that's a, that's a hard cultural bridge to, to, to build, but we're doing the work to, to get there because this Miami is, Deborah is, 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 is kind of the center of the bilingual uh, American sensibility, right? Are, are you well, we went very dramatic. Approaches? We have no signage um, because of the number of different languages and different dialects of Spanish that were spoken. When we opened in 2003, we were fully bilingual with our signs. But yet we offended some people because of the signage and the written word. So through our engagement with Reggio, um, we went fully no signs. And it's all intuitive. And I'm telling you, I'll go into an exhibit. And if I forgot how we were doing it or what we were doing, just ask a two or a three-year-old because they are so intuitive and they know where to wave and how to do something. Um, we just reopened our exhibit at Miami International Airport with a new component. And I'm standing in front of it trying to wave and make it work. A child walked in. They got it like that. So we really practice the intuitive. But another important part of children's museums is addressing the different learning styles in children. And when I talk about different learning styles, I'm also talking about children on the spectrum. And a big commitment um, to our audience is also making every child feel welcome, whether it's through lens, low sensory days or special programs. And we actually have a, uh, an exhibit in the museum that's multi-sensory. It's a snoozling room um, that we created where children have a complete decompression and an opportunity to adjust the lights and the sounds because we want every child uh, to feel comfortable. And being in Miami, we have a wonderful, diverse staff and team. So when children come in, they can see a person of color, they can see a person of their same background. Um, and it's a wonderful, engaging opportunity because if children don't see themselves or families don't see themselves, there can be a level of discomfort. We're really trying to break through that and make everyone feel good. It's so I interesting. I started working in museums. I was, you know, the term that was used all the time was access. And are you providing access for people? And I would say that increasingly everybody has done everything they could to do that in terms of, you know, free tickets or free, you know, anything like that. But I think one of the things we've all learned is that access is nothing without invitation. And that invitation is implicit in the in how welcome people feel, and that that's really the place where we need to be. It's so interesting what you're what you're all describing. You're taking different cuts at this idea of, of meeting people where they are. I want to remind um, our viewers that if you look at Apple, the Apple uh, iPhone, the design of the Apple I iPhone was specifically shaped so that you don't need written instruction in order to use it, right? It's so very elegant. If you go through any international airport, particularly in areas where there's a lot of multilingualism, like in Europe, it's all done through icons rather than words because they don't know who's going to be walking through and whether they can understand the, the, the language of, of necessity. So there are times and places for written words, spoken word, for uh, icons, for um, for um, uh, the facility to uh, lower the temperature, lower the light, lower the sound. There are different ways of approaching this. And if we can think about 
the wisdom in these different approaches. For example, in the design of the most popular consumer electronic line that the world has ever seen, right? We can su- we can suddenly have our have our mindset shifted as adults. Um, I, I, we're we're getting to the to the end of uh, of our time here. I'd like each of you to um, to comment. We're going to we're going to continue with Caroline. Go to Deborah and give Matt the last word on on how the interactions function with the adults here. Um, Deborah, you had said that, and Caroline, you would you would nodded vigorously about sort of. The the who drives the change the agenda for changing um, you know exhibits and so on, but Caroline, could you talk a little bit about the role of adults within your environment and outside of your environment and how you think about um, advancing that role in a productive way um, in the interests of, of the learning of children and families? No, yeah, sure. Um- our, our visitors need rides. They can't get there by themselves. So obviously the adults are super important there. Um, and we are adamant that we are not a place, we're not the ballroom at Ikea. You can't just drop your kid off and let them interact, right? Um, we try to model with our staff um, that a parent should be interacting. I mean, clearly, you know, we probably all pay the electric bill by having people who need to get out of the house and put the kid in a room and just sit there and catch up on their phone. That's okay if they need that support, but we also try to provide opportunities um, for kids to, to work with their parents and to have them see that they can, you know, work on a hands-on activity together. Or again, it's this idea that Anyone can do an activity by themselves, but when two people do it, it increases what can happen exponentially. The number of solutions to a problem, the quality of the solutions in the work. So we try to sort of demonstrate that. And and uh, Deborah, do you shape experiences for your parents um, that then um, redound to the benefit of, uh, of, of children as well? Is that part of your brief? We, we, enga- we engage uh, the family engagement. We promote family engagement. We do not have Wi-Fi in our building for our visitors. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a conversation we enter into probably on an annual, if not biannual basis, um, because we don't want parents on their cell phones. We want people to let go of the outer world and come in and engage and have the experience together. Sometimes we get some pushback, um, but I think it's a great experience. We also took away most of our seating um, throughout the museum to encourage the family engagement. You know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about these two different approaches is that on the one hand, you have accommodation. On the other hand, you have um, a little bit of structure, which is not. We believe kids are VIPs. (laughs) Right. So so there's not uh, the the message that you're sending is that there's not just one solution. And, And I think that that's really important that we accommodate different ideas and perhaps go into our place of, of a bit of discomfort, like we can't always be tied to our devices, right? Which is what you're saying, Deborah. Or maybe maybe we just need a break, which is what you're saying, uh, Caroline. Uh, Matt, uh, take us t- take us out with with, uh, with with your approach over the Terry Lee Wells Nevada Discovery Museum. Sure, no no pressure there at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> listen, there there is there is no better model for learning for our youngest visitors than to see the adult in their life engaged in learning and asking questions and and failing and learning from that failure and trying again. We can we can and we do spend millions of dollars building these incredible exhibits and spaces and and they're beautiful and they're great. But that end game is to create that environment where everybody is engaged. That's the home run for us. And in one form or another, all three of us are doing that uh, in our spaces. So you're basically, um, you, 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 and I think that your colleagues view as your mission, uh, partly to, to model a way of behaving, a way of acting, a way of learning, a way of, of, of relating across uh, generations, but also within generations. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a collaborative, uh, peaceful, joyful way, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this fantastic knowledge, this fantastic experience. 
Uh, Deborah Spiegelman, uh, CEO of the Miami Children's Museum, Caroline Payson, Executive Director of the Providence uh, Children's Museum, and Matt Sinclair, President and CEO of the Terry Lee Wells Nevada Discovery Museum. Thank you so much for sharing your different approaches across the nation. Thank your boards, thank your staffs, thank your constituents, thank your volunteers, thank your funders. And we're going to be talking on uh, next uh, Tuesday about a related issue, which is uh, animal therapy, using animals uh, to help children, uh, help adults overcome trauma and to create a, a, another type of connection. Uh, please join us. Everybody stay healthy. Have a great day. And thank you all. Thank you for helping, helping us expose these terrific topics. Thank Thanks, you. Mark.